Hey, where is everybody? Dear Prudence. Dear Prudence. Dear Prudence, I host a podcast with two other people, but I have a strong feeling that they're recording without me this week. I think it's because I demanded they binge all seasons of Buffy in one week. Is that unreasonable? This is such a mess. Prudy, what should I do? Hey there, and welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is episode 48. I am Ebony Adams, the artist formerly known as Ebony Astor, and I am troop leader in the absence of Anita Sarkeesian. As always... I'm joined by my best girl guide, Carolyn Pettit. Hey, Carol. hey This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love, or alternatively, where the feminist killjoys coming for your media, depending on your perspective. Today's show is one we are incredibly excited to bring you because we'll be in conversation with writer, raconteur, and Joan Didion impressionist Daniel Orberg. Daniel is best known as the author of Text from Jane Eyre and the Mary Spencer Tales of Everyday Horror as co-founder of the late lamented freaky feminist website, The Toast, and as the empathetic hand behind Slate's advice column, Dear Prudence. We're going to talk to Daniel about his life, literary obsessions, and work, so get ready for a lively and thoughtful discussion about everything under the sun. Now, on with the show. So, Ebony, this is I have a rare opportunity here, and I'm going to seize it. Seize uh, it! To, I have to ask you... How does it feel to be the token cis person on the show today? It's a moment. It's a moment I've been campaigning for. It's a moment I've been campaigning for. Yeah. I'm constantly, A, I'm constantly trying to get Anita yeah. off the show. Yeah. B, I was knew that my role on this team was to be um, the token cis person. Mm-hmm. I've been the token black person too long. <laughs> so it was time for me to step it up in other areas. I'm loving it. Well, this is the beginning of the show. Uh, Y'all yeah. have to vote in and let me know how it goes afterwards if I represent. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, n- I, now that we've seized the power in culture and media and politics, you know, it's it's great to have cis people who participate and because, you know, we were like worried if we don't give cis people any representation, they'll revolt and we don't want that. So thank you for doing your part to help Here's maintain the, the trans. I'm sure, yeah, yeah, I'm sure that y'all are really um, dedicated to representation and inclusion. But the fact is, it's really hard to find worthwhile cis people to, to bring on board. So <laughs> classic <laughs> banter. Classic banter. <laughs> hey, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so, so much for uh, having me on the show. I'm so, so glad to be here. This is going to be fantastic. Um, so without further ado, unless, do you have more ado, Caro? Is there any more? No, no. Of our, I, I like, mean, no. There, there's no more of our like patented banter I'm, that we need to get out there? I'm spent. <laughs> same, right. same. Uh, so let's let's talk about some pop culture news. Yeah. All right. So a couple of stories for you this week. Uh, First of all, more trouble in the wizarding world. Following hard upon the revelation that Nagini, Voldemort's snake, is actually an Asian woman with a blood curse. Uh, Well, um, although Fantastic Beasts 2 isn't even out yet, it's already been announced that Johnny Depp is slated to return as Grindelwald in Fantastic Beasts 3. And more than that, um, Depp has addressed the issue for the first time himself in an interview with Entertainment Weekly, in which he said, quote, "Uh, I'll be honest with you. I feel bad for J.K. Rowling having to field all these various feelings from people out there. I felt bad that she had to take that, but ultimately, there's real controversy. The fact remains, I was falsely accused, which is why I'm suing the Sun newspaper for defamation for repeating false accusations. J.K. has seen the evidence and therefore knows I was falsely accused, and that's why she has publicly supported me. She doesn't take things lightly. She would not stand up if she didn't know the truth. So that's really it. Now, so the the interesting thing here is, you know, that sort of by allowing, and Variety has sort of also covered this with a a story. The headline is just like, you know, Johnny Depp responds to controversy for first time, etc. You know, it's, it's basically giving him a platform to call Amber Heard a liar, you know, in these stories, which is kind of fucked up. 
At what point are we going, are these men actually going to have their lives ruined? Like, isn't that, isn't yeah. that what we, isn't that what all the hand wringing is about? Like, we're constantly being told that these good men are going to have their lives ruined by hashtag me too and the movement. And I have yet to see one of these knuckleheads, except perhaps for Weinstein now, actually see a second in the spotlight. Like, I don't need to hear any more from Johnny Depp. I don't need to see him anymore. That dude needs to get 100% less work than he is doing. And I honestly, I'm, I don't know how I'm still surprised by this um, because it seems as if mainstream Hollywood will continue to do the most for the absolute least. But given the, the like popular backlash to Johnny Depp playing Grindelwald in this, this upcoming um, Fantastic Beasts, I am actually surprised they kept him on, you know, like it just seemed like it would have been so easy to just let him moonwalk off the soundstage and not invite him back in. But yeah, here we go. Here we go. And also Johnny Depp stands the worst. So I encourage you to mute his name on Twitter (laughs) because those folks, whoo, they had their Wheaties this morning and they are ready to come out of pocket for their boy Johnny Depp. (laughs) Um, all right. Uh, this next story is actually pretty important to me and interesting. So there's a film coming out in December uh, called Mortal Engines. It's uh, produced by, you know, Peter Jackson. It's a big special effects spectacle of a film. It's um, directed by, you know, a special effects whiz at the Weta workshop. And um, so here's the the issue that uh, has come to come to light Um you know, in my in my Twitter feed, you know, in the past uh, few days, is it so in the book, the uh, the heroine of the book, whose name is Hester, is severely disfigured. Um, so by and this is like a description of her from the book to give you a sense of, of how disfigured, you know, what, what she looks like, quote, her mouth was wrenched sideways in a permanent sneer. Her nose was a smashed stump and her single eye stared at him out of the wreckage as gray and chill as a win- as a winter sea. Now, if any of you have seen trailers, you know, for the film, you know that in the film, Hester, um, she's, you know, she's got like a scar, but it's not, (laughs) it's not like, I mean, she's still a pretty conventionally attractive, you know, young woman. And so um, there was actually a petition created on change.org, you know, by, by people who, who, to whom it was very important that Hester be, you know, re- more reflect in the film her appearance in the, um, you know, in, in the book. You know, they 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 stated in uh, in the petition, they said, quote, you know, disfigured characters are rare in Hollywood. Disfigured female characters are rarer. And in both cases, they're almost always villains. Hester Shaw is an important is important representation for people with scars and disfigurements. And her journey is important to to, I guess, to, uh, you know, to people who ha- have similar, you know, di- issues in in the audience um so the director of the film christian rivers has addressed why she is not nearly so disfigured you know in the film at all he said uh quote it's fine in the book for hester to be described to be ugly hideous and have lost a nose because even that you reimagine it in your own mind as okay yeah she's ugly but she's not really ugly Oh, my God. (laughs) Tom, so this other character, this male character, Tom falls in love with her. And film is a visual medium. With a book, you can take what you want and reimagine it in your head and put together your own picture. But when you put it on film, you are literalizing it. You're making it a literal thing. So it was just finding a balance where we need to believe, where we need to believe that Tom and Hester fall in love. And her scar does not, does need to be disfiguring enough that she thinks she's ugly, uh, it can't be just be a little scratch, and I think we've struck a good balance of it, which they haven't at all. And like, I I feel like, you know, it's so gendered this issue, right? Obviously, oh, yeah. like in you know, Shape of Water, you have a, a a a human woman who falls in love with like a literal fish man, but the idea of a man, a young, you know, in a film falling in love with a woman, you know, they did this to a lesser degree in Ready Player One, where uh, the the Artemis in the book, you know, has like a noticeable birthmark on her face. Uh, and in the film, it's it's like n- nothing. Um, and I just like I feel like if this film had really got, 
stayed faithful to the description of Hester in the book, yes, it would have made audience members uncomfortable. Yes, when they're watching Hester on screen and seeing Tom fall in love with her, it would have, you know, they, they would be very aware of it. But I want them to be made to look at their own prejudices and their own discomfort, right, with that and, and, and like, have to, like, contend with that. And instead, though, the film is going the, in the very conventional direction of not doing that at all. Yeah. Uh, and I, it, yeah. I, I am um, the, like, Holly, the trope of Hollywood homely or Hollywood ugly is so fascinating, um, particularly as, you know, it gets gendered, as you say, because, you know, the, where we can laugh about um, egregious examples, you know, like in, with, say, teen films, right? So the the bookish main character wears glasses and her hair is up. But then at the time when her makeover is supposed to be complete, her hair comes down, she takes off the glasses and suddenly she's supposed to be beautiful. But it's like, this chick was beautiful by anyone's standard throughout. But I am, I almost don't know what to say. There's so much to unpack in that director's statement, starting with the idea that if the experience of reading an author's words... Um, Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, a, a reader has the power to imagine what they want, you know, when they confront the words on the page, right? But that that is fundamentally different from the words on the screen. It reminds me of when The Hunger Games came out and there was all that backlash about Rue, a character who was Black in the books, being Black on screen. It just, I guess people people absolutely see what they want to see, mm -hmm. but there's there's so much to talk about with that director sort of refusing to acknowledge what is a fundamental part of these books. I assume is a fun, I don't actually I haven't read yeah. uh, any of these series. Are, are these the books by Cassandra Clare? No, uh, no, okay. no, they're not. Uh, the author's name is. I don't have it in front of me. Did but I, how many geek points did I just lose by not knowing? Because I feel like I should know. <laughs> Daniel, do you know anything about these? These books or this movie? No, I'm so sorry. It's I've okay. Like... No, I feel better. I just needed someone to, I, I couldn't be the only one standing out here on <laughs> Nerd Island being like, I'm sorry, this passed me by. Right there with you. <laughs> okay, right on. All right. Well, just I just want to touch real quick on one last story before we uh, before we move on. This actually happened just before, literally, like just before we started recording this podcast. So if uh, if I if it seems to those of you listening to this in the future, like I don't go into much detail about it, it's because the story just broke and I don't have much information about it. But um, Chuck Wendig, uh, who's a like involved in in Star Wars uh, comic books for Marvel, um, or has been, I should say, and ha who has been a a big target of the Comics Gate movement, um, has just been uh, just been fired by Marvel. And uh, Chuck Wendig, in it, he certainly tweeted on Twitter a thread which um, you know made it clear that he at least believes that this is a result of Marvel slash Disney caving again to pressure from, you know, comic skate, uh, the rabble, the harassers um, who who have, who are just like ragingly incensed about the way that he puts um, like LGBT characters and characters of color and so on in, you know, prominently in his Star Wars story. So it seems a bit like um, sort of James Gunn all over again, you, you know, another example of Disney kind of caving to the the, the like angry alt right mob of people who who uh, don't want to see uh, who don't want Star Wars, etc. to to focus on anyone other than the the white men that it traditionally focused on, and so uh, it's just tr tremendously disappointing news to yeah. see that. I'm I'm infuriated that we won't get any more Star Wars stories from Chuck Wendig. I just started Aftermath. I'm I'm late um to the party but have been loving it. So I'm I'm angry about that, but I'm more angry that we're handing this faction a win. Um it it seems as if, you know, Gamergate, Comicsgate, we've just ceded so much territory to these vile, hateful people. And I 
it's just, it's one more thing. As you said, the story is just breaking. I just saw um, Chuck's tweet that you shared. So I haven't been able to, to go through the entire thread, but much love, Chuck. Love your work and um, fuck them comics gators. Y'all, Tied, I, I do believe that the uh, moral arc of the universe eventually bends towards justice. So huh, that's, all, that's, that's what I'm holding to. All right, let's move on to... Our discussion, oh my God, I'm so, okay, so before the podcast started, I apologized to Daniel because Anita couldn't be here today, um, but the truth of the matter is, I would have come to blows to be the host for, for this <laughs> because I have been a fan for so long, not to make it weird, too late, I already did. Daniel, thank you so much for being here. If I ask you anything you don't feel like answering, um, fake a coughing fit and our producer will find some way to... Uh, to like patch in something else. Thank Maybe you. Maybe one of his, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> awesome. Um, I want to start with this. On two recent episodes of the podcast, this podcast, we discussed two different testosterone funhouse narratives. We talked about Top Gun, and we talked about the new Amazon Prime series, Jack Ryan. Have you seen Jack Ryan? I have not seen. I think the last Jack Ryan movie I saw was Hunt for Red October. Oh, the first and the last. Yeah, I exactly. Is- as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, that's precisely what I wanted to talk about. So <laughs> back during your days at the toast. By the way, when you, you- said testosterone funhouse, I was so worried you were going to start talking about Paul Preciado. And I was like, please don't ask me to have a public opinion on Testo Junkie because no, I don't want to read gonna- it. I'm, I'm going to circle back. <laughs> no. So back during your days at the toast, you and and uh, co-founder of The Toast, Nicole Cliff, did some quality movie yelling about The Hunt for Red October, which is the first film adaptation of the Tom Clancy character of, of Jack Ryan. And in that segment, you start off by saying, okay, so, sorry to read your words back to you, but Please, this was it. so hilarious to me. Okay, so... So I saw for the first time in my life the greatest movie ever made by human hands this week at your house. A movie that I thought was about what a good idea it is to blow up nuclear submarines, but was in fact about what a good idea it is to not blow up nuclear submarines. And then you go on to say, you and I both, perhaps maladaptively, respond very, very strongly to a specific kind of male authority. And this movie produces that specific kind of male authority in spades. Not most male authority. We are like very specific whales that only respond to male authority on a certain gentle frequency. So this is something that we touched on a bit in our discussions of the the series Jack Ryan and then the movie Top Gun. Namely, that both of them have very little of the kind of male authority that you were talking about. Can you talk a little bit about what you you identified? By the way, I loved Hunt for Red October. What you identified and took such delight in in that movie and what... Why is that type of masculine energy so appealing in film? I think, uh, you know, obviously we're being like fairly goofy. I think both of us really identify with Tim Curry's character in that movie. Oh my God, so earnest. Who's just like, I know what I'm going to do with my life. And that is make sure that these guys get the order of Lenin. Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, you just, you sort of love that they never, it's mild spoiler alerts for the hunt for Red October. Oh, God. Um, his, his illusions <laughs> are never dashed. Um, and anyone who has lived in the world usually has their illusions the, dashed. The captain's going to, no, that's Sean Connery. I was trying to do the Tim Curry character. <laughs> I can't do the Tim Curry character. The captain's going to scuttle the ship. Oh, but, um, yes. Yeah, you'll have those illusions dashed. Um, and I think um, certainly in, in, in the hunt for Red October, there's just like there there is a certain joy in the fantasy of obedience, um, and, and something about just like you know, what if Sean Connery were a good person? I think that's a great question for a movie to ask. Um, and of course, it's a fantasy; it's not real. He isn't. Um, but uh, yeah, there's just like you know how just sometimes you're like. God, I really, really wish that I just like had a plan to like, you know, take a a, a whisper drive, uh, you know, to, you know, a, a beautiful young Alec Baldwin who's afraid of flying and and just like we're gonna be and okay. And is married to Gates McFadden. Married to Gates McFadden, which like apparently she had more scenes, but they were all cut. So we literally see her for like five seconds say, in the movie. I can't imagine her have having had fewer scenes. <laughs> She's yeah. just like, I have red hair and I'm English. Goodbye forever. Yeah. Enjoy the sea, <laughs> right. which belongs to men. Yeah, it's a ridiculous movie. It's very, very wonderfully silly, and I love it. And it's all about like, you know, just 
handsome, handsome men in very enclosed spaces quietly trying to be right and getting yes. more and more nervous. And there's something really great about that. Um, uh, and I think at least part of the reason we were talking about it in that way was because most of the time that's that's not how if you if you respond to that sort of thing with a desire to comply, uh, life will not go well for you. Um, so it can be nice sometimes to have, you know, a, an hour and a half where you imagine that you and Sam Neill are going to get an RV and move to Montana together. Mm. Um, and and get, you know, stout women to love us. And raise rabbits together. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's a dream that resonates with a lot of people. It, it's a very weird and a very specific dream. Uh, I After this movie, a friend of mine told me that his dad had actually been a submarine captain. And I was just like, thank you for <laughs> wow. telling me that. Please make sure I'm never alone in a room with your father because I will start crying and ask if I can salute him. And I don't even, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think military expansion is a good thing. I just, something about knowing this dude's a submarine commander. I'm going to be like, sir, teach me how to shave, please. Yeah. Well, it's like finding out that someone you know um, has a parent who's like a long haul truck or whatever, and suddenly you become obsessed with CB radio and what it's like to be on the open road. You know, there are certain things we don't have access to. And when we find that we have some, some proximity to it, we got to get all our questions out. Have you ever heard the almost certainly untrue rumor that Paris Hilton is a CB radio nut? I've never heard no. that. It is, again, I, I would like to just preface this by saying it is almost certainly not true. Um, but there has been for a number of years a rumor floating around that she is like a ham radio enthusiast um, <laughs> and has like an entire wing of one of her mansions dedicated to, you know, building and repairing old radios. Um, and that she has like a secret handle that she uses on the old networks and... Um, you know, every once in a while, again, it's like just total urban legend stuff. But somebody's like, oh, yeah, no, I was in Germany one time and my truck broke down and like somebody pulled over and it was Paris Hilton. She helped me repair it. Um, it's my favorite thing. And Yeah, um, I don't know that I've ever wanted something to be true more. But also, Phil, when you master this episode, I want you to do like a, a ding or some sort of scoreboard. Every time Daniel gives us a piece of information like this, I want you to add another point because you've blown my mind twice. Um, so far, both with the Smash Mouth musical and then this Paris Salt does a secret CB nut. By the way, I, I, I am now on antiqueradios.com. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm in a forum thread that just says those rumors about Paris Hilton, dot, dot, dot. Um, and then the first post is just, let's get on board with welcoming Paris. Why wouldn't we welcome anyone who may have an interest in this hobby? And I just wow. think that's great. However unlikely, yeah. I hope it's true. If she were a midnight radio enthusiast, it could be a boon to our hobby, raising awareness of vintage and ham radio, and potentially adding some new life to the hobby. Welcome, Paris. Oh, that's Yeah, you know, I love it. I mean, as somebody who spends a lot of time in extremely unwelcoming communities, it's so great to see this, see that community reaching out, you know, so earnestly to Paris Hilton. I, I think this does feel connected to the... the um, Hunt for Red October thing, which is like, it is so important to snatch moments of fantasy and escapism. And it is also really important not to mistake them for anything other than delusions. Yes. Right. Yeah. But like, ultimately, the world is not always a, a deeply welcoming place. Um, and uh, submarine commanders are not, in fact, gently bearded Sam Neill, who wants to live with you in Montana. Um, so recognizing fantasy and enjoying fantasy are two things that are difficult to put together sometimes, at least for me. Whoa. Mark another one up on the, the scoreboard, Phil. Three. Blown my mind three times. Okay, so Daniel, I, I got some of this or this information I'm about to relate from Wikipedia, so hopefully it's not wildly wrong. Is it true you grew up in Illinois and San Francisco? It, it is partially true, yeah. I was uh, born outside of L.A., and then when I was eight, I moved to outside of Chicago. And you only say Chicago if you're talking to people who are not near Chicago. I did not grow up in Chicago. Um, and then uh, when I was 16, I moved to the Bay Area. Oh, wow. What a cool time to move to the Bay Area. That's really interesting. I, I was born in L.A., grew up outside of Chicago, and then around when I was eight, moved back to Los Angeles. What part of outside Chicago? Uh, this, this neighborhood called Hazelcrest. Okay. Uh, I couldn't tell you offhand right now where it is exactly in relation to Chicago. I just know that as a kid, every once in a while at school, I'd get on a bus and like 
you know, an hour later, we'd be at the Museum of Science and Industry or something or shed. Uh, what is it? The aquarium shed aquarium, oh, the shed aquarium, and, yeah, you know, yeah. and just be my, have my mind blown by the amazing museums and stuff in Chicago. But, You're in that was Cook County. That was okay. that was also the county that I was in. OK, cool. Awesome. OK. Um, For a second there, I thought we were going to go a have you ever seen these two people at the you know same time? <laughs> Um, is there some sort of, you know, switched at birth or lost twin situation you know, I mean, going there? I mean, we're seeing each other now, so I think we can confirm. <laughs> yes. I mean, if you can take our word for it. Yeah, but but that's the thing, is that I'm in a separate place from y'all, so no, I can't take your word Trust for it. Trust but verify. It could be one person doing two different voices. Um, I feel as if I've gotten to know Carol over the past couple of years, but she might have a secret life I know nothing about. In fact, I'm sure of it. I contain so. multitudes. You do. You do. Yeah. Daniel, if I had to guess your background purely from your work, there's no way I would guess Midwest or West Coast. What? Right? Like, there's no way. I would assume that you were either like the second son of a bookish but impoverished New England clan All or right. the wry, world weary patriarch of a once great house in Italy. This is Maybe some remarkable fan a fiction. Hero from an Agatha Christie novel. No, no. Um, I I am a child of the West and the Midwest. Talk to me about how, where you grew up and how you grew up. Because I understand um, your parents are both pastors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about how, where you grew up and how you grew up inform, you know, your work today. If you can, you know encapsulate it let's do it yeah Podcast so, style. you know I, I have a deeply suburban soul um which i cannot escape or or, or get away from um and uh, i grew up uh yeah uh, like reading you know the the pilgrim's progress and, and and the bible often so i have a real um connection to like uh, historical and religious literature that did you just say you grew up reading the pilgrim's progress often yeah it's a very rereadable book Yo, for it, whom? It I took the <laughs> pastor's <laughs> children. Pastor's I children. I'm still traumatized by a course I took in grad school back basically when the Pilgrim's Progress was being written. That was that long ago. I still have not gotten over it. If I got through that thing completely once, um, in, in fact, I don't know that I got through it. Yeah, I'm gonna I, be honest with you. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna keep it 100. I don't think I got completely through it. Uh, understandable. There are a lot of books from from the olden days that I have not gotten all the way through, and I don't think you should ever try to force yourself all the way through a book if that's just not going to happen. But um, it is, it, as you probably know, then if you studied it, it was once the most commonly uh, owned book um, in in big parts of Western Europe and North America, aside from the Bible. Um, so there's a lot in it. There's a lot that shows up in other uh, kinds of Western literature. Um, and I also used to have the Marvel Illustrated comic of The Pilgrim's Progress. That's a thing that exists. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that. Oh, my God. Was that like, was yep. that like a high-rent chick track? Um, actually, yeah, yeah. Um, that's That's like... Totally, it. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling it up right now, and it looks like it's available My on Amazon. My favorite Marvel superhero is Jesus. Yeah. So, <laughs> Marvel Comics, uh, the Christian Classics series. At some point, Marvel Comics did had an imprint that was the Christian Classics series. Um, and uh, yeah, My, wow. Oh my gosh! Yeah, there's the little Marvel Comics label in the top left hand corner. Like, I did not hallucinate that. That really happened. I'm gonna get. Um, a used copy for my seven-year-old nephew, and I'm going to immediately lose my ranking as favorite aunt. Uh, He's going to be like, what is this shit? It's, it's so, so good. I've read like two comics in my entire life, this and Camelot 3000, <laughs> and they've both been deeply influential. What was your childhood like? Weird. Like, I'm, just, I'm just imagining tiny you and the very rich internal monologue that must have been going on yeah, constantly. It, it was sometimes a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I loved this stuff. This was a fabulous comic book. I have not reread it recently. I'm sure it's bananas. <laughs> yeah, check it out. Let us know if it holds up. But no, that's that's really interesting to me. I'm I'm not kidding when I say that it, it, it's more than just the the subjects that you write about. But there does seem to me uh, to be a very there's a patina of uh, like some sort of older aesthetic um, on your work mm -hmm. um, or this sort of 
what I consider to be a kind of, you know, New England kind of gothic, um, you know, this this sense and this like delight in the sinister. So yeah, had I not had trusty Wikipedia to tell me that you were a, a child of the Midwest and then the West Coast, I would have been like, no, some weird family in Vermont. Well, I, uh, you know, certainly like a lot of uh, queer children, I had a real sense of like- Wore a lot of tweed? Uh, yeah, like, don't you know who I am? Like, <laughs> I live in a novel of manners. And everyone's like, you do not. It is 1992. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is, you know, we are at the Jewel Osco. Um, so I absolutely, like, had that sort of sense of, like, I'm going to read a lot of, like, Robert Benchley. And yeah. oh. I'm going to read a lot of Woodhouse. And I'm going oh, to Woodhouse. be uh, kind of insufferable in a very specific way. Um, um, so can we talk a little bit about the evolution of your work from The Toast mm-hmm. um, in the segment Children's Stories Made Horrific then to your latest book, um, The Mary Spinsters? Um, so can you locate why horror is such a fertile field for your work? Oh, golly. Um, I, I always feel like I am not as good at um, describing uh, where certain aspects of my work come from or, or how, how they compare to other aspects. Um so you have got me at a real disadvantage. Um, I like horrifying things. I like being scared. Uh, I like thinking about things that scare me. I think about them a lot, often involuntarily. So sometimes it feels helpful to just um, get specific because <laughs> that way at least um, I'm narrowing in on a handful of things that can scare me instead of just letting the like anxious engine of my mind run nonstop. Um, yeah, I want to touch on something because so it's, you know, it's October. It's this. It's the spoopy season. And um, yesterday I saw, so this tweet made the rounds um, by uh, Warren is dead, at, at, you know, at Warren is dead. So he um, he juxtaposed two tweets. One, uh, you know, a, a, a tweet uh, that reads, um, just passed a house with a child skeleton as a Halloween decoration. People should realize these are not cute. When you see one in reality, it is at minimum a human tragedy and at worst a hashtag war crime. Um, oh, wow. Which, which Warren is dead humorously juxtaposed with a drill, a wind slash drill tweet um, that goes, that says, Fear is used to enslave the masses, I said, as I ripped the fucking decorative cardboard skeleton off of the community center's bulletin board. But really, I think, like, when people who, people don't understand, like, how, I mean, you know, we need, I feel like as human beings, we need you know, children need fairy tales that have scary shit in them to kind of prepare them in some way to cope with the scary shit of being a, 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 an individual human being in a in in this often cruel and often lonely world. And like, and I feel like there's, you know, to me confront to me having like child skeleton Halloween decorations is like, yeah, there's something about it that's like cathartic or that in some way, y- y- it it it. I don't know. It, it, it the, the psycholog the psychology behind this is obviously like super complex and deep and whatever. But um, you know, I just feel like, yeah, I, it, it. I have a hard time when people find that like inherently unhealthy because I think it's like really yeah. not only healthy but kind of necessary on some level. Yeah, um, we'll we'll get to this a bit more in the What's Your Freak Out segment, because the thing that I will be freaking out about this week um, deals with that explicitly. It's uh, this show on Netflix called Hilda. But yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And I think, um, you know, we we talk about writers like Maurice Sendak, for instance, right, who were well aware of the use and allure of the frightening in children's literature, children have such an appetite for it. Children as a group, not necessarily each individual child, um, but um, but they have such an appetite for it. And yeah, such a need for it because I, I think it allows them to feel and articulate that which is already there for them. It's not as if seeing a child-sized skeleton is going to put the idea in their mind that there are things to be frightened of. Um, like it, the the scary things sort of predate, you know, the visualization of them. But, um, okay, so getting back to you, Daniel, I want to pivot to your work as an agony uncle. How did you start doing the Dear Prudence column and podcast? And, like, when did you discover, I have this very specific skill set, which is giving advice to people um, that I trust is something that they need to hear. Like, how did this all begin? 
Uh, so it, it began a couple of years ago when the um, editor at the time, uh, Julia Turner, had emailed me to ask if I wanted to be part of like a group of people auditioning because um, they had an opening. Um, and I said yes. And then I did a couple of test rounds and then they offered me the job. So that is how I started doing it. It's very uh, prosaic. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think... Anyone who is willing to give advice to people has that skill set. Like, I don't think that there's um, anything uh, unique about, like, me in particular um, that that makes it especially distinct. But um, I don't no, have a great I, I answer. Think there, I think there is because um, I, I don't think I'm alone in this. I love to read advice columns. Uh, and one of the reasons why I love to read them is that almost always um, – uh, you know, I'll be presented with a question that someone is asking, and my advice will be almost perpendicular to what the advice columnist gives. <laughs> That's like, awesome. That I, I never share a response with them. And yet, oh, you've got to come I, on the show. I have, <laughs> I, I have, I think, the grace, once I am presented with a much more human, a much more empathetic <laughs> response to think, oh, yeah, that's actually better advice. But my first reaction is always dead wrong. Dead wrong. I would and like I'm an so example, please. I would very <laughs> much like an example. I just well, I mean, I think I'm, I'm not talking about the the obvious ones where someone writes in and you know they're in like an obviously um, abusive situation, and the answer is you need to leave this person, you need to set up systems whereby you know you're going to be safe, et cetera. Like I, I'm not talking about those, but I, I can't even think of an example. Just know that of the you know hundreds of uh, of letters that you get, whatever you think those people should do, there's someone out there, i.e. me, that is thinking up some banana soup version of what they should do. And it explains everything about why my life is the way it is right now, because obviously I'm taking my own advice and it makes no sense. But no, I think there are um, advice columnists that I cannot read because it seems that their their columns are just a platform for whatever, you know, kind of bullshit mannerly Thing they need to talk about, but you just ha managed to convey such a quality of listening and and caring, even when someone, even when the person writing in is, you know, fucking up, just like, you know what? Hey, I want you to do better. I think that is a skill. Well, I, I will always, you know, take the compliments, although you were just very hard on yourself for like a solid minute and a half. So, Oh, no, I'm not saying my advice my, my is bad, but I think my advice would be entertaining as long as folks knew. Like there was a, you know, caveat at the beginning. Do not take this advice. I, I want our audience to know, because some may not, that, that both Anita and I have been on uh, Daniel's uh, Dear Prudence uh, advice podcast, uh, and Ebony has not yet, and we have got to get Ebony on that show. Like oh, that. no. Uh, so Phil, our wonder producer, is like, hey, is this ever something you think you might be interested in? And he can confirm. I was like, you don't want me. I will be responsible for someone doing something horrible because they might take my advice. But like, this is not wise. I, I mean, I think if if an advice columnist were to put themselves in the position of saying I am now responsible for lots of strangers behavior, um, that would put the advice columnist in a really difficult situation. And I think mm -hmm. what seems clear to me in the advice columnist and advice column writer inner um, uh, relationship is that they are asking um, simply for a quick take. Like it, it is, you get a couple of paragraphs. Here's the situation as I see it. Um, what do you think? And, um, you know, I, I based on limited information um, and coming from a, you know, very specific uh, vantage point, um, I'll say, I think you should do this. Um, but there may be stuff that I don't know that's super, super relevant. Or they may see that and think, this actually helps me realize I don't want to do that at all. Um, or, you know, I, I can certainly relate to the idea of asking lots of people for advice and then thinking, I'm going to do nothing. Like, this was a helpful taking the temperature. I am not going to make any decisions right now. So I, I don't think that people write in automatically um, assuming, like, this is super binding. The second I read your advice, I have to go execute it immediately, come what may. Um, I do tend to think that people um, continue to exercise their own judgment and, and decide whether or not they want to take all or some of my advice. Um, 
And I also, you know, I don't always hear back from people. So it's possible that people don't take it. It's possible they take it and it doesn't go very well. Like we don't we don't have a strong sense of what my success rate is um, or even what success would look like. Uh, so I, I certainly don't want to say that just because my name's on the column, I've got to be right. Um, I'm comfortable saying that on your behalf. I, I'm glad you're comfortable. <laughs> yeah, no. One of the things that I love is how um, there will there will occasionally be a sort of conversation, you know, after you give the the primary response, where people will write in um, or respond in the chat and say, you know, hey, what about this? You know, this this might have been, um, you know, a complicating element or whatever. And you know, you are very eager to say, oh yeah, I had not considered that, or here's something else. Um, it, it is it is rare for you to present things as the final word. Um, you know, sort of the the Ten Commandments of how things should should go, but you you nevertheless have a kind of authority. I like whatever. We'll move on from there. <laughs> Thanks. Um. So before we head into um the what's your freak out segment, I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of your um online life, if that's cool. So I actually discovered you. Discover is a weird word, but I you know uh, found you online via someone else's someone else retweeting you. Mm-hmm. Um. And this was way before I learned about your kind of, you know, official writing career. Um, so I knew about you only as a Twitter person hmm. first, which is, you know, kind of weird, right? You've talked in other interviews about taking some time off Twitter and spending more time on Instagram. Um, and I wonder if you have thoughts about that as, some, as, a, as a writer, as someone who is known for his words um, and the way he crafts words. Um, do you feel like, you know, you, I don't know if this is a superficial question, but I, I have noticed other, um, you know, writer friends, writers that I admire um, making this sort of transition. And I wonder, if, you know, um, to what extent it's kind of the natural sort of just growing tired of one platform um, and wanting to move into another, if there's a more deliberate um, kind of, you know, severing ties with Twitter based upon the the poison and the toxicity there. Um, if there's something that's very alluring about the type of documentation that happens on one platform or another. Is there anything to that question? I don't know. I just feel like this is something I've seen other writers doing lately. And I wondered if you had thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, you know, lots of different platforms. Some of them can be really useful to people and entertaining and necessary. Sometimes they can be not that way. Sometimes things shift. Um, certainly for me, like the time that I, I think I was off for about a year, you know, um, I had just finished uh, doing the toast, which had been a really, really big part of my life for a long time. Um, I was staring down the barrel of, am I going to transition, which felt really overwhelming. And um, especially given how I use Twitter, the idea of using it and not talking about it, which was not something I was ready to do, felt really difficult. Um, yeah, and I just did not have a sense of like, what do I want to do or be on Twitter? And I didn't have a good answer. And the idea of not being on it sounded good. Um, so I did that. And that was really useful to me. And um, I, I didn't immediately start using Instagram that kind of uh, came at a slightly different point. And I think not everyone, but I think lots of people who are like dipping their toes into the waters of transition or starting transition can get this sense of like, oh, God, I need to document my face a lot because I'm looking for something and I don't know where it is. I think it's in my face, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Again, that's not that's certainly not a universal experience, but um, it's one that I, I kind of experience. And I know some other people in my life who have transitioned um, have gone through just this kind of sense of like, wait, what is my face? Do I have opinions about it? Do I have mm-hmm. thoughts about it? There are, there are aspects of it that I have always thought as immutable and not worth thinking twice about. And now all of a sudden, I'm wondering what it would be like if they changed. Um, so there was a sort of um, uh, maybe compulsion is too strong of a word, but certainly a need to say like, is this my face? Do other people see the things that I see when I look at it? Um, and that was something that was easy to do on Instagram. So that that was something that kind of um, took up a fair amount of my time and energy. I think, honestly, I think the first thing I ever posted on my Instagram was a picture of like, maybe the second thing was like my dirty laundry on the floor. And it was just like, this is the surface of my floor. Uh, mm-hmm. I am on strike from cleaning up my bedroom until I look like... Um, uh, oh my gosh, Brendan Fraser circa 1998 or until conditions improve, <laughs> um, which is a very like, it was not especially subtle, but you know, it's that sort of hiding in plain sight thing that I, I think is sometimes uh, possible to do. And um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was helpful in a lot of ways. I, I love it. Thank you. Um, well, on that very thoughtful note, we are going to slide into what's your freak out? Caro, yo, do you want to kick this off for us? Sure. 
Uh, all right. So my freak out this week, you know, it's again, it's October. It's the spoopy season. And I decided to watch a film by a director who I greatly admire, a filmmaker named uh, Olivier Assayas, who has made, you know, I, um, a film called Summer Hours, which I adore, uh, a mini series called Carlos that I think is uh, phenomenal. But um, he last year, a film came out. Uh, from him called a uh, personal shopper starring Kristen Stewart, um, which I had not seen. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it involves ghosts. It involves Kristen Stewart plays a, a medium, you know, she's a character who has some connection to the spirit world. And, um, you know, the basic premise is that her brother has, uh, recently died and, um, she is looking very much looking for some sign, some clear sign from him that he's, you know, on the other side and that he's okay. And um, there's definitely some, you know, it's not a, it's not like a horror film, but it definitely has some some really freaky or unsettling moments. It's also not a conventionally satisfying film. Like, I, I'm not recommending it as, like, it's not, it doesn't have mass audience appeal. You know, the the ending is pretty challenging. It's not, you know, it doesn't, it's, again, it's just not a conventionally satisfying film. It doesn't try to be. It doesn't want to be. It is, in my mind, like, as a kind of, uh, a film that uses, you know, ghost stories and horror elements to uh, to present a portrait of someone who is, uh, isolated by trauma and grief and who is kind of contending with with grief and with trauma um it's just it's it's kind of fascinating it um it uh it you know it's, it's just kind of still rattling around in my head uh, you know um a week and a half or so after watching it um yeah and Kristen Stewart is fantastic in it um as this person who is kind of um as i said kind of isolated by by grief um uh yeah so i i you know if that sounds like something that you might find interesting check out personal shopper i'm so glad you talked about that because i had been wondering if that was something that i would enjoy and based upon what you've just said i think i will um check it out i am looking forward to having a a very spooky kind of unsettling remainder to my <laughs> october it took me until just now to realize this had no connection to the like lightly comic uh, Steve Martin novel Shop Girl, oh. which I was confusing <laughs> with in my head. Yeah. And I was just like, wow, yeah. Steve Martin yeah. has really yeah. like changed it up in the yeah. last 10 years. Yeah. Um, no, he is not. They are not connected. Yeah, no. I, I Yes. But now that you've said that, I hope someone does a super mashup um, on YouTube that I can watch because I would love it. I would also be super down for it if Steve Martin decided to, like, pivot into horror for a while. Oh, yeah. Rather than doing another disappointing tour with Martin Short. Okay, I, yeah. Oh, uh, was it, was it I, disappointing? I mean... It's frustrating because I, you know, I grew up admiring both of them so much. Yeah. And I still do. Like, I think they're great, very funny, you know, comic Yeah, and like, minds. who the fuck am I, right? Like, no, I, I mean, no, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, like, yeah, like, I feel like... Yeah, there's a there's a there's a uh, an energy, a wit, a kind of unpredictable excitement to a lot of Martin's work that maybe you know the edge has kind of gotten sanded off as he's gotten older, and that's fine. You know that happens a lot, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I would love it if um, we got to see the version of Steve Martin um, that was you know in line with the version of Robin Williams. We got to get. Um, the the dramatic, creepy side that we saw in, what was it, like, One Hour Photo or um, Insomnia? There is, it's not, like, super creepy, but there is a film, a David Mamet film called The Spanish Prisoner with with Steve Martin in it, and yeah. he's, he's good in it. Like, he definitely shows a side to him that I, I would have liked to have seen more of as well. All right, so get on that, um, Steve Martin, giving you some A-plus career advice here at Feminist <laughs> Frequency Radio. Okay, so my freak out for the week is a, um, a Netflix series for kids that I just stumbled upon. So Anita and I just wrapped up our book tour for History Versus Women, and uh, 
our second, our penultimate stop was in Santa Cruz at Bookshop Santa Cruz. And I, while I was there shopping at the end of our um, signing, I was looking for a book for my seven-year-old nephew, and I saw this series of graphic novels and that had merchandise available as well, because of course, um, called Hilda. And then um, later this week, discovered that there's a Netflix series. So Hilda is um, about this, I believe she's about 10, this 10-year-old girl with this great waist-length blue hair who lives in this vaguely Scandinavian set. Um, I am such a brand. Oh my God. As I say it right now, I realize exactly why this show appealed to me. But anyways, it's in this sort of pseudo Scandinavian set, um, half wilderness, half small town, <clears throat> excuse me. And she, the, the, the world that she lives in um, is just full of these magical creatures, trolls and giants and weather spirits. Um, and, and what, yeah. And she saw, she solves grisly murders of these trolls and spirits and things? Uh, well, of course, because, the, and it's very gray. She wears lots of great sweaters. Um, she <laughs> she works out a lot of her past trauma. Yeah, it's exactly in line with everything I watch, right? But uh, so I was so impressed by this show, for one thing, because it's, it's tremendously funny. Um, and there's so much media for children that you watch and you think this is this is not something that would have appealed to me as a child. I don't know what children. It, it just seems to be really underestimating what children want and what they're capable of. But as I am no longer a child myself, I don't really feel comfortable making that that judgment. Um, but with this show, Hilda, I am comfortable saying I would have loved this um, if I was, you know, between seven and eleven years old. Hilda is fearless, and she is fearsome. She is so interesting. She is so giving as a friend. And yet she makes mistakes. And one of the things that I'm so in love with about this show is that I, I'm not sure how many episodes there are in the, the season that's on Netflix, but the show does not do what a lot of, say, sitcoms do, which is reset to the status quo at the end of every episode. So, you know, the uh, we see the the main characters in the kind of typical uh, milieu that they're in, there's some sort of problem. They deal with the conflict that arises from that problem. The problem is resolved and then things reset at the end, right? And maybe someone's learned something, but it's a very sort of mild lesson and things go back to the way they were at the beginning of the show. This show doesn't do that. There's a very real sense of growth throughout the show. And also there are things that don't get resolved at the end of episodes. And so as I've been watching it, I think I've seen like 10 episodes so far. There are episodes that end with children being scared scared of um of you know some some creature that's terrorizing them or the the three main friends in the show um Hilda her friend Frida and their friend David um they've been fighting and um the show ends and they're the, the fight has not been resolved. They haven't gotten back together and they're still very upset with each other. And I just think how valuable that is for kids to see, um, to see that sometimes it takes time to work through things. Sometimes you say things you don't mean that hurt other people, that it is okay to be scared. Um, I, I, I can't express how much I love this show and how delighted I am to have found it. And after I speak to y'all, I will probably watch the remaining episodes of season one. So... That's my freak out for the week. Daniel, what are you freaking out about? What am I freaking out about? I am freaking out about the new Haunting of Hill House adaptation on Netflix. Yo, did that just come out to start today? I believe so. Nicole okay. is already watching it. So it okay. either came out today or yesterday. Okay. Um, and I am very, very excited. I will endlessly watch any adaptation. Shirley of, Jackson. You know, like I'm just, I'm fine with it, even if it's terrible. I, I actually just rewatched the 1999 version and I will maintain that it has moments. Uh, <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> that's high praise. I'm not going to go, I'm that's, not going to go harder wow. than that. But, they should put that quote like on the, you know, the pose, the promotional poster. It, it has moments. It has moments. Um, Daniel, Daniel Orberg. <laughs> and the other thing that uh, I'm still freaking out about is this year I finally got around to seeing A Dark Song, which came out back in 2016, but um, was fantastic. And uh, I enjoyed it very, very much. And it feels thematically appropriate because it is another horror adjacent movie. What's it called? 
It's called A Dark Song. It's an Irish horror film. I don't think I've heard of it. I'm gonna have to look this up. I think that you should. I'm always looking for something creepy to watch. Awesome. All right. Well, that is it. If you want to have your freak out broadcast for the world the way that your femme freaky uh, hosts do, submit your own freak out and it might make it onto the show. Just head on over to femfreak.com slash freak out. That's F-R-E-Q-O-U-T. All right, kids. That is our show. You can catch us back here every single Wednesday. Stay tuned for the bonus episode, which is only available to our drip backers. Are you one? Are you one of our drip backers? You can be. Just head over to d.rip slash femfreak. And if you are enjoying the show, please rate and review us on iTunes and tell your friends about us. You can check out all of our work and our other podcasts at feministfrequency.com. So be sure to follow us on Twitter at Femfreak to stay up to date on all the news. You can find Anita at Anita Sarkeesian. You can find me at Double Dip. I'm using the call sign we came up with last week. That's it. Um, Carol, where can people find you? People can find me at Carolyn Michelle. And Daniel, where should people find you if you want them to find you online? Don't find me. Leave me alone. I'm Yo. doing fine. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You um, live your life and I'll live mine. <laughs> you know what? I want to take my handle back now. Leave me alone too. Uh, special thanks this week go out to Topher Ruth and Northgate Studios at UC Berkeley for their kind donation of studio space for this episode. Our producer is Phil Circus, who also composed our theme music. Technical support is by Sarah Norales. Art by Jamie Varon. We will see you all next week. Later. Later.